So let's look at some, you know, I'm talking to a group of people like, like we're talking to remotely here. You guys know more about 3D printing technology than anybody in the world. Certainly more than we do. Certainly more than we do, so we're going to stumble through this a little bit. There are some really cool projects that we've seen cropping up in the last year or so, though. Uh, this is a device called a MakerBot from MakerBot Industries. Um, and the MakerBot is a 3D printing device that anyone, theoretically, can build. And I think you can buy these things in kit form from MakerBot Industries for somewhere around 900 bucks. Uh, they're pretty hacky to put together, but they kind of work. And now this is the project that that MakerBot is actually based on. This is called a RepRap. This is a project from, uh, I guess, originally MIT. Um, and what's particularly cool about this device is that it, uh, it is designed so that it can build copies of itself. So it can actually replicate itself. Uh, and then, you know, the great mission here is that everybody in the world should have one of these devices at some time. And then eventually this thing becomes the Terminator uh, comes back and tries to wipe out the human <coughs> no, species. No, we're going to hopefully not do that. Okay, we're going to stop we're short. Stop of, short of that. Stop short of wiping out the human species. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is actually the second generation model of the RepRap. It's called Mendel, um, and uh, yeah, we're going to build one. I think. So there are devices available. You guys all know about even better devices and even cooler technology that's making this all possible. There's still this problem, right? Okay. If you look at this diagram. The things in black are the things that users understand. They've got a 3D model, and they want to get a 3D print of it. Okay, So what do you have to do to get it there? And it turns out that this it doesn't really matter what modeling program you start from, although obviously I'm going to be talking about SketchUp in most cases, and we're a surface modeler, and so you have to do certain kinds of things. Okay, So the first question you ask is, I've got this model. Is this model OK to print? And what does that mean? It's got to be watertight. Is it scaled properly so it fits in the machine? Is it at the right level of detail so little tiny details don't fall to powder or whatever? Has it been shelled so that you know, you're using as little material as possible? Once you've got your model in decent shape to print, which usually takes a few iterations, then you've got to ask yourself the question, can I get my model into some format that my printer can handle? Turns out there's not a lot of universality around this, although you know, STL looks pretty good. Uh, we're hoping that some other formats come online too. Uh, but it might be that your, your modeler can't export to a format that your printer can understand. And so then you get into this uh, sort of cycle of going from one, machine, uh, one program to another to another to another and kind of leapfrogging from file format to file format. We'll talk more about that in a second. But eventually you can get a file that prints. You can send it to your printer where it might or might not print. You might have to iterate a couple times there. But in the end, you have a 3D print. And it took a long time, maybe. And it, it might have actually cost a pretty penny. Probably did. I mean, every time you run through the printer, you're talking about at least a couple hundred bucks, depending on how big it is. And it turns out that in practice, it even gets more complicated than that. And I'm going to uh, leave the name of the company that's got this process in place. Uh, we'll leave them anonymous for now. It's not materialized. <clears throat> it's not materialized. We'll talk about that in a second. So in this case, this particular company needs to do their water tightness test uh, from Accutran. So that means that we've added not just the process from before, but actually we've got to convert uh, a Collada file to STL with MeshLab, and then take that STL file and import it in Accutrans and check for water tightness there. And of course, if it's not watertight, then what do you do? You throw it back to SketchUp or whatever program you were using to model, and you redo the whole process again. One particularly nice thing about this process, though, is that STL isn't the only file that, that works. Collada also works. And Collada is a file format that we really like a lot at Google. It's uh, very easy to write, very easy to read. It's extensible. Um, and our free modeler and our professional modeler will both read and write that format natively. You, so. should, you should check to see if your favorite modeler also reads and writes Collada, because uh, we think Collada is a great format, and uh, we think it has a bright future. There's nothing necessarily wrong with STL. It's just that STL is really only an exchange format in uh, the 3D printing world and things that are related to that, whereas Collada also works in DCC applications like Max and Maya. It also works in Google Earth, and it's making some inroads in the GIS space. And it does color. And it does color, which is really great. STL, I 
I don't think SGL does color. Anyhow, let's keep moving. Because the story gets even better than this, and I think that in the last year or so, we've seen some really exciting developments where uh, companies like Materialize have now released plugins uh, which sit, again, I'm talking mainly about SketchUp, but this isn't the only place where this sort of thing could work. Uh, it's a plugin that lives right in SketchUp, and it kind of makes a black box around that whole complex process from the user's perspective. It's just a black box. You've got a process that you follow. It ends with uploading a file to uh, a service on the internet. It gets printed, put in a box, shipped to you wherever you are in the world. Boom, easy. Uh, there's also a company called CADSPAN out here where we are in Colorado that does a similar thing. And, and we think there'll be more of them You know, as time goes by. I'm sure there's someone probably in the audience who I've forgotten to mention their product, but it's exciting. We're starting to see things that look more like you know, what the printing process is for printing uh, a document on a laser printer. You know? And that, that's really kind of the best of all possible worlds here. You press a button and you get a 3D print. Of course, it's not that easy. This is uh, something called the Candy Fab 6000. You can't see me right now, so you can't see what I'm doing. I'm, I'm pointing at my belly. And uh, this is to say that I'm, I'm sort of food motivated, a bit like a science rat. But the reason this machine is so exciting to me is it's actually a, a machine that prints in sugar. It's called the Candy Fab 6000. I think we said that already. But uh, I guess what happens is you load in files and it prints food. Very exciting. This thing actually exists. Well, before you move on, too, I should say that this was actually designed in SketchUp by our friends at Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories. Um, and it's, you know, in its 6,000 series, it's had a few variations. The, 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 the 1,000 series was a little fly-by-night, uh, but it's, it totally works. It's actually kind of interesting. And that's just a big bed of white sugar that it's printing in with a, with a heat gun. It caramelizes the sugar. This next project is called the Cornucopia Food Printer, and I don't believe this thing exists even in prototype form right now. It's a series of beautiful three-dimensional renderings, but the, the thought here is that uh, you'll be able to print three-dimensional food, not just sugar, but I think those colored things on the top are different food elements or something. Mustard and, and mustard, ketchup, starch, soy, fat. Soy protein. I mean, there's like a container of fat, and the idea is that you just print yourself something. So. A cheeseburger, maybe. The conclusion here is that uh, this thing needs to be easy and it needs to be cheap, but it also needs to be worthwhile. And uh, the point at which these 3D printers are not just printing models of things, but also the things themselves, and better yet, things that you can consume almost immediately, will be the point at which consumers really, really jump into this stuff. And we've done our part, or at least we're doing our part with the 3D software. Materialize and other companies like Materialize are doing their best to make this a reality as well. And we think it's super exciting. So I think that's basically what we have to say today. I wish we could be with you to uh, field questions and, and, and talk about this over the next couple of days. Unfortunately, we can't. Uh, if you have questions for us, though, we'd be more than happy to take emails. I'm Aiden C. at Google.com. I'm the evangelist guy. And I'm Jay Backus at Google.com. I'm the product guy. Uh, and please do email us. We love to hear from people, and, and we'd love to know uh, what's going to happen next. Wish we were there. Thanks very much for coming.